Let's talk about prayer. Can we talk about prayer for a while? You guys ready? I got 25 minutes to show you again how powerful and effective your prayer life is. And next week, guys, I've never taught at what I'm teaching on next week concerning prayer because I've never known it before. I've never looked at it this way, but I'm going to be showing you next week really the effectiveness of your prayer life and how you are a praying person, even though you don't define it as prayer because you don't pray in a certain way. Maybe it was modeled for you or taught for you or, you know, it isn't this hour alone or whatever, but we are praying people. Whether you're a believer or not, everybody prays. There's no atheists in foxholes, right? You might be praying because you're mad at a God who didn't show up the way you wanted him to, but you're still praying. You're still talking. There's still conversation. I actually prayed for a man one time, and he was, he was a, um, a homeless Vietnam veteran who uh, had been involved in warfare and was really having a hard time dealing with it many years later. And I said, buddy, you just, you just need Jesus. He said, no, I don't. I don't trust God. He sent me to Vietnam. I said, hey, I'm going to pray for you. He said, no, no, you're not. And I said, dear God, he goes, I'm, God, don't listen to him. He started praying right there on the spot. God, look at you not counter praying my prayer. I said, I pray for my friend. I'm no friend of his, God. You're no friend of mine. Don't listen to his prayer. You know, and finally, I, I just, I said, God, I just pray that you'd, you'd arrest him. I pray that you'd catch him. I pray that you, and he, he finally said, God, it's not fair. Why did you send me to Vietnam? Why did I kill that child? And he just began to bawl and gave his life to Jesus sitting on a bench right there. And now he gave his life to Jesus. He actually got filled with the Holy Spirit right there on the spot. And, and, I was, and he just dries his eyes about 10 minutes later. He goes, what was that? I go, I the book of Acts? I, I don't know what to tell you. So I'm telling you, you are praying people. And uh, we're going to show you more about that. So let's talk about this. Last week we talked about the Lord's Prayer a little bit. Jesus teaches us to pray. They've cast out demons. They've healed the sick. They've raised the dead. They've cleansed lepers. They've been sent out. They, it's Jesus' testimony about the fruit of their ministries. I saw Satan fall like lightning. Like you body slammed. You WWF'd his little curly tail down on the ground. Like it's, it's amazing what just happened. Like you guys rock and uh, so it wasn't like you won by three. It's like you won by, you never showed up. You forfeited when you showed up. Amazing stuff. But now they come to him after all these things. We're in Luke chapter 11, so a year and a half, two years into following Jesus, and they say to him, teach me to pray. So we asked last week, why? What are they, what are they really asking for? They know how to pray. They, they're Orthodox Jews. They know how to pray. They've been to the temple. They put their hands on the bowl, the day of atonement. They've said the repeated prayers. They've, they've prayed for the sick, and they've recovered. So when they say, teach us to pray, what are they really asking? We found that last week there's about 900 plus names of God. He's the God who provides. He's the God who heals. He's the God of, uh, who's our father. He's our Abba. He's our protector. He's our deliverer. He's our comforter, et cetera. So 900 different descriptive names of who our God is. And, and so when they say, teach us to pray, Jesus starts with these words. He just says, Father. Matthew chapter 6, our Father. Luke chapter 11, Father. He starts here because I think what they're really asking is not, Hey, we, we need more isms and schisms. We need more methodology. We need more how, how long should our list be and, and what's the right words to say if it's this sort of demon and what's the right words. They, they're done with mechanics. They're done with even theology. What they want is relationship. Are you still here? And so in their prayer life, he says, if you're going to really know how to pray, like you're asking me to teach you what I know about prayer, it doesn't start with methodology. It starts with him. So we're going to start with him, Father. It starts with Father. And this is what we, we drew from last week is this. God really wants to be known. Like the reason you have a spirit and he is a spirit is that there's, not, there's no translator needed between you and him. There, there's no, it has to go into this interface. You ever, you ever have a Mac computer, but you can make it think it's a PC by dividing the hard drive? Dumbest thing ever. Either buy a PC, they cost like eight bucks. And then buy a Mac, that costs like 8,000 bucks. You know what I mean? But to make your Mac act like a PC, it's like, why would you do that? It's, it's like buying a Cadillac and making it think it's a Hyundai. You know what I mean? It's just a personal thought. But, but I'm a Mac guy, it probably shows. <clears throat> and and if, unless you go to Ohio State, you don't even need a PC, right? Because they're behind the time. So, But in this, in this situation, he, he's, saying, he's saying, listen, I, I, I want to be like, you don't need an interface. I hear the unspoken whispers of your spirit. You don't pray as an act. You can, but I hear even when you're not praying. That should freak somebody out. I, I hear your heart's desire. I hear when you're upset. I hear when you're happy. I hear when you see a sunset and you just go, I know you're talking to me when you say, wow, because I'm the one who made that sunset. I, I, I know you. I know the hairs on your head. Some of you, it's not hard to count. I, I know you. I know who you are. So God wants to be known. Say it with me. Come on. God wants to be known. He, there's no barriers. Like Jesus removed the barriers. So there's no barriers for us to know him. He wants to be known. Father. So let's, let's know him. What's the next thing he says? Hallowed be your name. 
Now, Hollywood is not something we use very often, so I had to look it up. I'm a pastor, been doing this for 30 years, and I thought, I wonder what Hollywood means. <laughs> I've said it a thousand times, and I think I know based on the context, but really what it means, it means to be totally respected, held in awe, greatly honored, even, even to be worshipped. Man, God, your name is so incredible. Hollywood be your name. Now, Jesus does something here. And he reveals really a needed tension in prayer by going straight from Father, Abba, Papa, uh, Pater. We talk about that's the, word, the, the Greek word there, Pater. It's, it's to be a, a Papa, a Father, that sort of thing. That's great. But then the next word is it's not this relational intimacy. It's the awesomeness of God. Now, here, here's the balance and the tension, right? We need to know the goodness of God. This is why he says Father. If you don't know the goodness of God, you'll never get to the greatness of God. You've got to know that you're welcome in his presence. You've got to know that your problem, no matter how insignificant it may seem to you, if it matters to you, it matters to God. That's the extent of his goodness. You guys have kids, don't you? If they had a boo-boo, it's not like, it's not like their, their leg fell off. They've got a, a skin knee. But doesn't their skin knee, because of the pain they're in, doesn't that move you? And if, and if we as earthly parents with six pounds of gray matter and, and three pounds of, of, of pulsing heart, if, if, that, if we know that, we feel that, and we move on behalf of that cry, don't you think our Heavenly Father does too? And even greater than this. So we've got to know His goodness. If you don't know His goodness, you'll never ask for His greatness. And one of the greatest obstacles to you realizing you're praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and one of the things that keeps you from asking for things that God wants to give you is we don't trust the goodness of God. We trust our own goodness, which, by the way, is filthy rags on our best day. And when we measure ourselves by religious standards and compare ourselves to the heathen that lives next door, we might feel good enough to ask for something. But then if it doesn't happen, we say, well, you know, God's busy. I don't want to bother him. I can't tell you the number of people I said, well, we should pray about that. And they go, well, you know, God's busy. It's like an infinite God is busy. An infinite God who's revealed himself as Father is busy. Let me tell you something. God is no more busy today with eight billion children than he was with two. God's capacity is not being stretched by humanity. Come on. You know, two minus infinity is how much? Infinity. And eight billion minus infinity is what? It's infinity. God's infinite. God's not being taxed. God's not being stretched. God's not being stressed. God's budget still has an infinite amount for people that he loves, and, and that's the world. For God so loved the, right? So he's, his goodness has to be known, but also we've got to know his greatness. And this is why I think he goes straight from Peter, our father, to, you know, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's happening here is I think we, we teach, Jesus is teaching us to be very careful of the big guy upstairs mentality. How many of you guys know God likes you, but God's not really like you? Does that make any sense at all? God's love for you, his affection for you, his goodness towards you, unquestionable. But for us to say, just to kind of walk in, kind of, hey, you know, I'm going to pull this, and, and I, I want a bunch of dollars to come out. Oh, it didn't happen. Where was God when I put my last dollar in the slot machines? Like, well, he was saying, get out of the casino. <laughs> like, like he, he can't be manipulated by us like we can be manipulated. He can't be convinced of something wrong being right, like we can be convinced of something wrong being right. He knows what's best for us. So it's important that we understand that there's this needed tension between God's goodness and God's greatness. In Romans chapter 8, it um, says the Spirit cries out, Abba, like the Holy Spirit inside of us. Once we're believers, Jesus comes into us, and so we, we cry out this, this paternal, this, this Abba, this Papa God thing, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's something beautiful. There's, there's everything right with that, yes? But understand, we're not just praying for intimacy. We're praying to change a world. So we have to know both his goodness as father, but his greatness to affect change as his kingdom comes to earth. Are you guys still here? We can manipulate our daddy, our earthly father. We can get the BB gun if we try hard enough and, and sweep the garage and be nice to our mother and don't beat up our sister and all that kind of stuff. And okay, and then you get the BB gun. God doesn't work in performance-based rewards. There are blessings, but it's not like if you don't hit your sister, I'll give you a BB gun. That's not in his vocabulary. Hear me. We need to know God is so good that we feel safe, but God is so great that we can be dangerous. Man, the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Violent prayers are prayed by people that know the goodness, but also know the greatness of God. He's teaching us the hallowedness of God, because in his name we will go and win the nations. Amen? 
So coming under God's name does a couple things. It establishes, first of all, the understanding of our authority. We're establishing in our prayers the kingdom or the domain of the king on earth. When we pray, we're not praying for our will to be done. We'll get to that soon. We're praying for God's will to be done. Well, God's will is not for children to die of starvation. So we need some powerful praying and some powerful actions to feed kids. He, he doesn't want girls to be sold into sex slavery or boys to be sold into sex slavery. There's going to be some act of justice, some act of law, some act of divine intervention. We're going to pray God's heart for those children, but we're not going to sit back. We're going to get involved in these things. We're going to look for these things. We're going to be aware of these things. When we travel somewhere the same weekend as the Super Bowl, we see a bunch of, you know, 15-year-old girls with some guy that doesn't speak, you know, like he looks like a mob guy, like his language, and they're, they're all like making eye contact. We need to say something. Hey, I think these girls are being trafficked. Like good people need to do good things to prevent bad people from doing bad things, right? So we have action in this, but we're praying. We're asking God to put us in the thick of it. We're asking God to change the world. How many of us know the prerequisite to changing the world is asking God to change it? And what you'll often find is when God breaks your heart for something and you pray about it to relieve the pain, God calls the most qualified person to do something about what's killing you. You know who it is? Look at the fields and see that they're ripe on the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. The labors are few. Pray. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send labors in the field. And so they do, oh, God, send somebody. Oh, God, we need another labor. There's labor, sheep without shepherds. We need help, God. Send somebody. The next chapter, verse 1, I think it's Mark chapter 10, goes to verse chapter 11. The Lord calls them together and sends them out. He said, pray. They pray, oh, God, their heart attaches. Oh, I look at the fields. I see the fields. Pray. I'm praying. Oh, God, send somebody. Congratulations. God's going to answer your prayer. It's you. Careful what you pray. No, don't. Be reckless in your prayers. Be a rhino, man. You know what I mean? You know how far a rhino can see? 30 feet. You know how fast a rhino can run? 40 miles an hour. You cannot stop a 4,000-pound animal in 30 feet. So what are they doing? They're rhinos. Whatever's in their way will get out of their way or suffer the consequences. The righteous shall be as bold as lions. We shall pray prayers like rhinos running 40 miles an hour. They can only see 30 feet in front of us, knowing that whatever we hit, God is bigger than the tree that's in front of us. There's a recklessness to this. If we know the greatness of God, there's a recklessness. We have authority. Second thing, it gives us an identity. I am my father's child. Man, I'm no longer an orphan, and I'm no longer a slave, and I'm not merely a son. I am an heir. I am a co-heir with Christ. In other words, the family business belongs to me. And sometimes as Christians, we get a little bit confused, or, or not confused, but we get incomplete theology. You're the child of God. Rest in his grace. Absolutely You've been adopted in his family. You're his son and daughter. Absolutely. But hear me. Please hear me. We are adopted into a family, but the family happens to be at war right now. You've been adopted into warfare. So was I drafted? No, you were adopted. But the kingdom of which you are a member is at war. We have a season to do all the damage to the, the kingdom of darkness that we can. And that's all we get. Work while it's day because nighttime is coming, Jesus tells his disciples. It's our identity. Lastly, it's, it's our security. Whoop, that went wrong. And... Establishes authority, identity, security. There it is, security. As adopted children, in the day that this word adoption was used, the Greek culture, it's a Greek word, so the Greek culture actually had the definition for it. And please hear me. All of you, not just today. Okay, it says this. It says that we are, um, as adopted children, natural-born children could be disowned by their mother or father if they behaved in a way that was displeasing to them. But an adopted child could never be disowned. Let me just say that again. I, you need to hear this. An adopted child was not under the same covenant of parental relationship as a natural-born child was. A natural-born child could be disowned by their father or mother if their behavior was, was unpleasing or dishonored the family. But once adopted, in the Greek culture, if you adopted a child, you were never allowed to disown that child. They were yours for life. Now, the child could choose to walk away, but the father and mother could never disown them. This is why Jesus says, I believe, I will never leave you. I, if there's going to be distance between us, I will not be the one who put it there. I promise you, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Hear me. I began a good work in you, and I will, I will be the one that is faithful to complete it. You have to be the one that follows along with it. So authority, identity, security. So we put it all together. It's this. My heavenly Father, who is awesome and worthy of my greatest respect, has given me his own name to come under and to utilize for the changing of the world to reflect his will. Are you guys still here? 
If you thought prayer was like this, well, God bless Billy and God bless Susie and, you know, oh, I've been praying for three hours. Nope, it's been 10 minutes. Oh, God, make time go faster. Um, you know, you're, you're really missing. Please don't forget, but make definitely secondary the mechanics of prayer and relationship the primary of prayer. Because, you know, it's funny. I can hang out with people I don't like and time goes fast. I can hang out with people I love and time flies by. I, I spent with my counselor the other day, had a one-hour appointment. An hour and 45 minutes later, I walked out going, hey, I'm sorry, I went way over. I, I'm actually 45 minutes late for a conference call I had with the district. <laughs> so I showed up and said, okay, we're going to take a vote. Uh, anybody, any final discussion? Because I came to the conference call. I said, well, I see no reason why we, you know, shouldn't make a decision now. Because I, I had, don't know what you've been talking about for the last 45 minutes, you know. So they, they made a decision and everybody else said I, so I did too. How many guys think that's just good leadership? But, it, I mean, it just flew by because I was like, well, what about this? Well, how about that? Well, Gina, I, I walk in. This is Jerry. I walk in. Hey, my eyebrow hurts. He's like, really? Don't tell me about your toes. Like, I don't talk about my toes. It's my eyebrow that hurts. But just tell me about your toes. Humor me. I tell him about my toes. And, and guess what? The problem with my eyebrow had nothing to do with my eyebrow. It had something to do with my toes. You understand what I'm saying? That was an analogy, by the way. My eyebrow's fine. My toes are good, too. I, I'm, this is what's going on in my life. He goes, let me ask you a question. So he asked me a question. It has nothing to do with my problem. And as I find out, it's actually the root of my problem. And an hour and 45 minutes goes by. It's like this, and it's not because it's information. It's relationship. I love this guy. He loves me. There's an inner caring going on. Let me just, prayer should go like counseling should go or like fellowship should go or like getting coffee with a friend should go or like getting orders from your commander should go or like the briefing just before you take the field to go win a battle should go. We should, we should want to pray because Jesus is there. <laughs> Right? So if anything is standing in your mind saying, I just not, it's just, I'm not good at it, you're believing something that isn't true. You actually bought into a lie of the devil. And, and in Jesus' name, be delivered from that. Amen. Time to be free and to understand this. Listen, th we are here to accomplish his will. So what's his will? This is a great conversation. This is a huge question. And, and is this power and relationship for us? Is it for them? Is it for you? Is it for now? Is it for later? Was it only for back then? And as we talk about this, this is what Jesus says. He goes, let your kingdom come. This is what prayer really, functionality, this is a lot of the functionality of prayer. What God wants is this, and please, the kingdom come isn't we need a church on every street corner. We need more steeples. We need to outlaw certain things the Supreme Court has allowed. I, and I, I'm not belittling any cause. I'm simply saying this. When his kingdom comes, it's for the primary purpose of knowing the king. But never forget this. When the king shows up, he always brings his stuff. The king comes to your house. Things change at your house. The king comes into relationship with you. Things change in you. When the king comes to your city, the city changes. When the king comes to your nation, the nation changes. And when the kingdom of God covers the earth like the waters cover the sea, the world is going to be changed. So when we pray, we're, we're literally saying, it's, and I'm, this is an analogy, but it's almost like we're opening this, this portal, saying whatever is there, we, we need it here. So open this up so what's there floods here. Think of it like rain. The rain's up in the clouds, but when there's that transaction, when the, the elements come together and the heat, the humidity, and the cold, and the air, and the wind, and it gets dense enough, it begins to fall to the ground and waters the earth. Our prayers are, are that, that mechanism. It's that, that functioning, ongoing, God's moving on behalf of this cloud that's gathered because of the prayers of his saints, and then it releases, and it waters the earth with mercy, and it waters the earth with justice, and it waters the earth with food. Listen, prayer, I, I believe with all my heart, one of the things that really is missing for the revival that God wants to bring to the earth, not, not to the Freedom Center, not to any, but to the earth, the, the Lord's glory needs to be known by people everywhere. And what is, what is the one thing God has given us that we know is primary to the releasing of that glory? It is prayer. So if you were the devil, what would you convince the church they can't do and is boring and doesn't accomplish anything anyway? Man, I'm telling you guys, this is powerful stuff. Let your kingdom come. This is the will of God. It's not geographical. Uh, the word here is basilia. It, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, the boundaries of this room is the kingdom. It's not confined by walls. It literally is almost an atmosphere of authority that God has. He's king in this place. Therefore, this is the kingdom. If he's king in your home, your home is in the kingdom. If he's king in your car, your car is in the kingdom. If he's king in the school, then your school is in the kingdom. So well, prayer's not allowed there. Prayer's not allowed there, but you can't stop an invisible God from, from breaking in and entering. Because if you're there and the kingdom's in you, the kingdom's in the school, in the hospital, in the factory, 
in the classroom, uh, you know, at the university. Every place the king is king is the kingdom, the domain of the king. So when we pray, what is his will? We want you and your stuff to permeate this fallen world so that there are places, there are bastions, there are oases, says Urs, multiple oases. You know what I'm saying. Palm trees with water in the middle of a desert where everybody knows God lives there. And guys, that can be your home. That can be you. I don't know if you ever had somebody mock you because of your faith, but later on they found out they were dying. And they came back and said, hey, would you pray for me? What is that? They, they mocked an oasis in the desert, but when they were thirsty, they came back to drink. Because they saw the living God inside of you and the way you live your life. It wasn't because you don't cuss. It wasn't because you don't chew. It wasn't because you don't run with girls that do. It wasn't because you have a strict standard to watch PG-only movies. It wasn't because your kids watch Veggie Tales instead of Teen Titans. It's because there's something inside of you that when something inside of them needed something greater than themselves, the only place they could think of to go was you because inside of you is a king. And with the king comes his kingdom. It's the right to rule and to reign in place for people. In other words, what was lost in the Garden of Eden through the fall was restored through the cross of Christ. And because of that, it's it's reestablished by the people of God starting in prayer and consummating in actions of love, actions of faith, generosity, power, time, wisdom. Are you getting this? When, when we are the church, wherever we go, the king resides in us, the kingdom goes with us. When we pray, we're extending the authority of the king into the earth. And that is a reclaimed mandate from the Garden of Eden to fill the earth and subdue it. Everything that was lost in the garden has been restored through the cross, and the mission has not changed. 25,000 miles in every conceivable direction that we're sitting here right now. 25,000 miles. God says, fill the earth and subdue it. Bring it under the authority of the king. The, the, the mandate to go, to make disciples, to bring the kingdom, to pray, to worship, to know the glory of the Lord. Nothing has changed from the Garden of Eden. It changed for a long time, and then Jesus changed it back. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. It's time to take what was yours to begin with. I've restored it through the cross, and now it's time for you to go. You guys still here? All right. So think of it this way. Oh, piano girl's here. Perfect. Eight words. That's all we are into learning about prayer. Two weeks, over an hour of teaching, we've gotten eight words. And here they are. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Stand your feet, please. Nobody leave. I'm just going to pray for you every second. So, Father, I ask that right now, those who would hear these words today or a hundred years from now. In the name of Jesus, we declare sight to the blind. For those who are taught that prayer had to look, feel, sound a certain way, and now when someone says, would you pray over food in front of friends, they would be embarrassed because they don't know how to do it that way. Let their eyes open and realize you've heard every whisper of their heart. By the grace of God, you'll only remember certain whispers. Give them great faith in the blood of Jesus. Give them great faith in your powerful will. I ask you to give them great faith in in seeing a kingdom come. As you go, make disciples. As they go to the expo after church, as they go to mega, as they go home, make disciples. Those who can follow Jesus to the place of reproducing what they've learned from Jesus and other people. This kingdom is to multiply. This kingdom is not to be added to and subtracted from. It's to multiply. And so we pray, God, today, let your kingdom come and multiply by your infinite power, your infinite wisdom, your infinite grace. Let it multiply by your matchlessness. Let it multiply by your endlessness. Let us not pray small prayers filled with cowardice because we're afraid of being disappointed. Let us be a a crash of rhinos running 40 miles an hour not even thinking about how to stop. (laughs) Let us be a pack. Let your church be a crash. That's what a group of rhinos is called a crash. Let us be a crash of rhinos that couldn't stop no matter the obstacle. Jesus, have your way. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want you to ask the same question in closing today 
the disciples asked Jesus a couple thousand years ago. If you see that there's more to prayer than what you're currently engaged in, what you currently enjoy, than what you currently access, if you're learning that you have a responsibility on this earth to do more than just enjoy his presence, but to proceed with his presence to change the world, and you're, you're in this place where you're like, I, I get it, but I don't get it. I want you to say the exact same words in our language that the disciples said to Jesus in theirs, and that is, Lord, Master, teach us to pray. If that's you right now, say it. Just teach us, to, teach, teach me to pray. Teach me how to stay up all night long and not be tired the next day because I just couldn't let go of you. Teach me to pray that heaven would come on this earth. Teach me to pray that the wind and the waves would cease in the midst of a storm. God, teach me to pray for blind eyes to open, for the gospel to be preached, for the kingdom to be extended. Teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Now, I want you to do two things. As you pray that prayer today, I want you to do two things. Number one is this. I want you to know you already know how to pray in a way that is effective, powerful, beautiful, intimate. You've had it since your first breath, and no one can take it away from you. And anything that says otherwise is lying and trying to get you into a place of being crippled when you can walk. You, you, that lie trims the wings of a bird that was created to fly. See what I'm saying? Let, let, let these words bring back that ability to soar again. You were created with the ability to pray. Don't you ever believe anything less. He's hearing everything, even the whispers. Sometimes blessings we even ask for show up. It's like, what was that? I didn't even ask for that. And God says, I, I can hear everything. I heard what you thought. I heard what you whispered. I, I heard what you didn't have the courage to ask for, but, but maybe by me giving it to you now, it'll give you the courage to ask next time and even expect for someone else or for yourself. So I want you to do that. I want you to remove from your thinking the sentence, may it never come back again in Jesus' name. And the sentence is, I don't know how to pray. From this day forward, you're going to say it another way. I do know how to pray. Where I lack in my abilities in prayer, God more than makes up in his ability to hear my prayers. There is no division between my heart and his heart. None. He hears it all. Second thing, I want you to do this. But, but God, teach me to pray with a greater wisdom. Teach me to pray with a greater understanding, with a greater expectation. Let, let my faith grow from faith to faith, and let your glory be seen from glory to greater glory. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're not right with God, the greatest prayer you can pray, the greatest conversation you can have with God is just, it may sound strange, but it starts by saying things like, I, I failed, but because of your love, I'm not a failure. I've sinned, but because of your love... I'm not a sinner. You know me as me. You don't know me as my deeds. And I need your love today. I need your mercy today. I need to be forgiven. I need to be washed white. I need to be born all over again. I need a clean slate and a fresh start. And, and the things that I, I'll try to forget, please forget immediately and never bring them back up again. Let this day be the first day of the rest of my life and eternity. And this is the prayer that God loves to hear. When you trust him at that level, that the almighty, all-knowing God would say, I tell you what, confess it to me and I'll just forget it. We'll never talk about it again. Like, that's what he means. Forget it. We'll never have to talk about this again. I did that once, but then I went back and sinned again. Good thing Jesus died once for all. Good thing. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from unrighteousness. Good thing God's mercy is greater than our, than our unrighteousness. Amen. Because if it wasn't, this is a one-time thing, man, get saved and jump off a cliff as quick as you can because that's the only chance you've got to go into heaven. The grace that saves you is the grace that will sustain you. The last thing we're going to do is this. I want you to ask God for something huge. I want you to ask God for something God-sized. And, and the exercise is not to see it come to pass. The exercise is to see you begin to ask an infinite God for things larger than you can imagine. If you need healing in your body today, whatever it is, I want you to ask God for that miracle that is needed right now. I'm not asking anybody to pray for you. I'm asking you to go straight to your daddy right now in heaven and ask him to heal your body. We curse cancer in Jesus' name and uh, bone and spine and ligament and tissue issues in Jesus' name. We bind those things. Birth defects and um, juvenile lupus and, and all these things. We now bind these things in Jesus' name. We ask. We're not afraid of being disappointed. We're excited about the answers we get from our loving God, from our mighty King. In Jesus' name, we declare victory over every, every malady, every infirmity, every sickness, every disease, and every spiritual weapon formed against us. It doesn't prosper from this moment on. In Jesus' name, ask.
we got a big house around the corner. I, I've already asked. I'm asking. Asking for God's will. Whatever it is, it's impossible for everybody but God. I want you right now to exercise faith. I say, but what if I'm disappointed? Just stop. The primary function of prayer is relationship, not results. The greatest result of your prayer is relationship. But trust me, as relationship grows, results grow too, right? So don't, don't start with moving mountains. Start with the mountain mover, and trust me, mountains will move. So great mover of mountains, we come to you now. And we thank you for hearing our prayers before we ever prayed them. Move every mountain, God. Move every mountain. Especially the mountain of unbelief. Move it now, we pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you for just being you. Amen. Amen. Um, altar workers will be coming forward. Um, you got a breakthrough? Go enjoy it. If you don't, let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. If you'd like to go on the marriage retreat, and we talked about that earlier, I'll be back in the back room. Chris will be with me, and Chris will write down your name. We'll get you all the details. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'd love to meet you. Um, I got into ministry for all the money and all the fame, but as it turns out, I just really like God and people. So I would love to have some time with you. In the meantime, live long, prosper. God bless you. We will see you very soon. You're dismissed.